Thank you very much, Takashi. Hi, uh, I'm John Daly, you just heard from. I'm very, very honored uh, to be here tonight, and I'm honored to be the director uh, of the Rockport Exchange Program, which is uh, sending students to study abroad uh, at Maynooth. But what's happened now, this is the 13th straight year, we've had a fantastic Irish speaker come and visit us in the fall, and in the spring, we'll send our 13th uh, Brockport historian uh, to Maynooth to speak as well. And if you go on the exchange to Maynooth, I need to turn uh, on these mics. Many of you have heard about the study abroad for semester at Maynooth. Uh, yeah, Dr. Michael Potter is an example, as you see, of one of the fantastic scholars who you work with. Uh, this one will turn on automatically, uh, automatically when I go over there. Dr. Michael Potter's part of his horribly uh, field of research is the history and archaeology of medieval Ireland, with a special reference to landscape and settlement. He did his Bachelor of Arts at University College Dublin and in Lyon, France, and his, Maynooth, his PhD at Maynooth itself. Uh, so that's another great connection with Maynooth. His doctoral research was on medieval trim, which I can tell you is a fantastic town and an even better castle uh, than our, one of our future summer programs you can float by in a kayak uh, and, and wave to. It's one of the great uh, trips in Ireland. Uh, Professor Potterton has directed multi-period research excavations across Ireland. He believes in the importance of grassroots local studies, but set firmly within an international context. That's a value, as Dr. Nishiyama just said, that we share here uh, at Rockport. Combining historical, archaeological, and architectural analyses, his first book, Medieval Trim, History and Archaeology, 2005, demonstrated the interdisciplinary nature of his work. This was followed up with his next major book, The Dublin Region in the Middle Ages, 2010, which also showed his interdisciplinary skills. Uh, he has been beyond prolific. Uh, it's almost impossible to introduce these uh, speakers from Maynooth because you have to list endless books. So instead, I'll count. He has co-authored or edited collections for nine other books uh, and numerous book chapters and articles as well. Uh, as a press editor, he added more than 100 books for Four Court Press uh, in Ireland. He has presented cutting-edge research in more than 12 countries, uh, including three this week, uh, and included teaching at places such as the Sorbonne and the University of Toronto. And he has awards that are really too numerous uh, to list. I think his career is a model for the variety of roles an academic can play and the variety of fields in which they can excel. So we are very, very honored to have Professor Potterton here at Brockport. And let us welcome him as we look forward to his talk. Thank you very much indeed. I just want to check that the microphones are on. Is that okay? Can people hear me? Um, and that the lights are okay. You can see the screen's okay. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Daly, for those very kind words. No pressure at all, Michael. Uh, yeah, I feel it. Uh, thank you very much for those kind words, Professor, uh, Professor Nishiyama as well. And indeed to, to all of you for coming along this evening. Uh, it's been a great pleasure over the last couple of days to meet you personally and in classes. Uh, both faculty members and students. Um, I wrote down on this talk, which I'm primarily going to read at the beginning, of course, I wrote a word of thanks. Um, but it's become obvious over the last few days um, uh, what a debt of gratitude I owe you for your welcome. The weather may be very cold here, but the welcome has been very, very warm indeed. Um, and I've enjoyed my few days. I've got a little bit of a head cold. I think that's the air conditioning on the plane. Uh, but I hope you'll be able to hear me. And if I take enough swigs of water, I think it's water, we should be okay. Um, I have a, prepared a handout, partly because I'm going to mention a lot of places and a lot of names. Um, we are within a history department after all. But I'm also aware that there's a lot to take in, uh, and you might want to refer to this list. It's in simple alphabetical order, um, particularly if you don't understand what I say because of my accent or my slurred words. And then the second part of it is, uh, are two maps. You'll have to forgive these. These were hand-drawn through turbulence on a plane. Um, and I added in a few, I maybe geographically moved a few European cities, not quite to the wrong country, but perhaps to the wrong state. And then the map on the back includes a few surprises, I think, for Ireland. Um, I will be referring to most of these places, most of these people and events during the course of the next, I think, four hours, you said. <laughs> Takashi, we, four hours, we're good. We've got the tapes already. Um, right, okay, let's go. An Irish Renaissance. 
was there such a thing? Contact between Ireland and the continent of Europe in the 16th century. My, in my first lecture as a youthful and enthusiastic archaeology undergrad in University College Dublin 25 years ago, I was struck by the lecturer, well, not exactly struck by the lecturer, but I was struck by something he said when he explained that there was no evidence for human habitation in Ireland before about 10,000 years ago. He said there was no Paleolithic, you might say Paleolithic, I say Paleolithic, human presence in Ireland, and that people first arrived on the island in the Mesolithic, about 8,000 BC. I couldn't believe it. After all, we knew for sure that there had been people living on the south coast of England, our nearest neighbor, almost a million years ago. So what he was saying was that there had been nobody in Ireland for 99% of the time that there had been people living in England. And I just felt that this had to be wrong. It didn't make sense. It also means that, of course, there were people living in America before we have evidence for people living in Ireland. A lot of American visitors come to Ireland and say to me and my compatriots, you know, we've got such a long and ancient, rich history, uh, which we do. I'm very fortunate to have it. And, but, you know, America is such a new country. But many of you won't realize, perhaps, that there have been people living in what is now America for longer than there have been people living in what is now Ireland. In his office afterwards, I told him, my professor, that I'd like to do my essay on Ireland in the Paleolithic. He laughed and he said, uh, I told you, Michael, there is no Paleolithic in Ireland. What about those early stone tools found on the West Coast in 1927, I said. Fakes, he replied. And the Paleolithic hand axe from the Aran Islands, I suggested. Uh, misidentified, he proclaimed, as he searched for something among the precarious towers of papers on his desk. Uh, that lovely flint flake from Mel in County Louth, I offered, a little bit more reluctantly now. Brought in by glaciers in the Mid Midlandian Ice Age, he scoffed. And so it went on, one by one, he and almost every other archaeologist I met had systematically dismissed each and every new piece of evidence for Paleolithic Ireland, as it appeared. And so I shelved my idea for that essay. But over the months and the years that followed, that professor, John Bradley, who will be known to some of you here, and I became good friends. In due course, he introduced me to another good friend of his, Tom Heron, a literature scholar from Cleveland, Ohio, in fact whose main interests were William Shakespeare, Edmund Spencer, Renaissance cultures, and Ireland. Tom and I, too, became good friends, and in about 2004, Tom invited me to work with him on a project studying Ireland in the Renaissance. At first, I laughed as I thought to myself, Ireland in the Renaissance? Everyone knows there are no traces of the Renaissance in Ireland. And then I remembered the Paleolithic. So I joined Tom's project, and the rest, as they say, in history. Four conferences, two books, uh, conferences in three countries, many debates and discussions, many late at night, um, and here we are. Um, I was involved in the publication of this book, uh, Ireland in the Renaissance, in 2007, uh, and I'd like to leave this here and give this, a copy of this book to the Department of History. Perhaps you could find some use for it, holding a window open, perhaps, or a door. So I'm just going to leave this over here. Um, I would have brought a copy of the second book, um, which is more recent and more interesting, uh, but my wife sold our last copy on eBay. Um, <laughs> so if anybody happens to buy one and it has uh, to my darling wife written on it, uh, you'll know which one you've got. Uh, if it's signed by me, it's worth less. Uh, you'll, find, you'll find this as well. Um, and the other thing about my wife, by the way, because she's not here, I can say this. Uh, her, she's American. Her um, father, my late father-in-law, uh, is, was a very proud Italian-American. Um, and when I told him, of course, the, you know, the rows between the Italian-Americans, many of you here, I'm sure, and the Irish-Americans, perhaps a few of you here too as well. Over the years, there's a tension between the Irish-Americans and the Italian-Americans. And my late father-in-law used to remind me of that every time. And he said, Ireland in the Renaissance, and of course, the Renaissance, the heart of the Renaissance is Italy. This was something that he was very proud of. Ireland in the Renaissance, surely that, Michael, is the thinnest book ever. I bit my lip and I didn't say it was the second thinnest book yet ever after the history of famous Italian-American presidents <laughs> or Italian war heroes or we could, the list could go on, but I was, I was sensible and I bit my lip on that occasion. John Bradley was later my PhD supervisor, uh, a mentor and a very great friend. 
He is the reason that I work at Maynooth University, and he's the reason that I do what I do, generally. In 2012, I think John stood here on this Brockport podium and gave the Maynooth Lecture. Some of you will recall it. Sadly, John passed away uh, not long after that, um, far too young, uh, unexpectedly, and far too suddenly. And he left a big John Bradley-shaped hole in the world, um, and the world is a much, much worse place for it. Both his scholarship, uh, his gentleness, he was a true gentleman, a true Renaissance man in many respects, uh, and he will be very much missed, and I would like, for what it's worth, to dedicate my small talk this evening uh, to the memory of John Bradley. John loved America, and he really enjoyed his trip here. And I remember speaking to him afterwards. He spoke warmly and fondly about his trip here. And he said, you've got to go one day. And I wasn't working in Maynooth University at that time. And I couldn't see how I might manage a way to come here. Um, and serendipity or something, the stars have aligned and have allowed me to follow in John's footsteps in some respects. Um, footsteps that I could never fill, but I'll do my best. Ah, yes, that bare bone. You thought I'd forgotten, hadn't you? Um, so the year after John died, 2015, renovations were taking place in the basement, basement of the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin. They found a box of bones, which had been excavated from a cave on the west coast of Ireland, a cave, lovely, a lovely name, the Alice and Gwendolyn Caves on the west coast. These had been excavated in 1903, and the box of bones had remained uh, untouched in the basement of the museum until 2015 when they were carrying out renovations. And somebody was about to throw out these bones uh, when somebody else said, no, I think these could be important. And they pulled out a list from in it and there were Arctic lemming, brown bear, uh, various other perhaps slightly unusual uh, mammals for Ireland and uh, from the excavations at this cave. And so a project began to identify the bones uh, and to radiocarbon date them, something that wouldn't have been possible in 1903. And so they dated these bones uh, through a research project, through radiocarbon dating, to 12,700 BP. And they identified on this important little bone, and the important as, or importance as anthropologists and historians and archaeologists sometimes of the tiniest piece of information. This bone here is the knee bone of a brown bear, and it has butcher marks on it. You'll see them here. The anthropologists will have noted these immediately. The historians were probably a little bit slower and won't have noticed those. These are human-created butcher marks on this bone, not from 1903 or 2015, but from probably about 12,700 BP. This is almost incontrovertible evidence for a Paleolithic in Ireland. Now, I know we're not here to talk about prehistory, and I know I'm here to talk about what I call the Renaissance, and you might call the Renaissance. But this is late Paleolithic. And so things that have been dismissed in the past as being either irrelevant or non-existent perhaps can come into focus again for various reasons. And as students, and we're all of us students, of whatever side of the podium we're on, uh, we need to bear that in mind, that evidence that we have perhaps dismissed in the past can come into sharp focus in a very useful way. But wait, what was the Renaissance? Mm, potato, potato, renaissance, renaissance, I think you know what I mean. Well, as many of you will be aware, the word renaissance is uh, French, and it means rebirth. Uh, in Europe, it's the name to given, given to that period after the Middle Ages, um, beginning in about 1400, and characterized mainly by a renewed interest in the classical world. Ancient Greece and Rome, which were seen as golden ages of European history, and by major developments in art and architecture, literature and music, philosophy and religion, exploration and map making, medicine and the sciences, among other fields and disciplines. The Renaissance began in Italy, in the Tuscan city of Florence, to be more precise, but gradually spread to other parts of the continent. Indeed, in due course, we could recognize what is generally referred to as a northern Renaissance, especially in Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium and England. The Renaissance saw Europe's first printed books, the growth of schools, universities, and libraries, the Protestant Reformation, the discovery of new lands, and all sorts of remarkable, remarkable innovations and inventions. An extraordinary succession of almost 20 popes and their cardinals were among the greatest patrons of art and architecture. Some, it seems, let their power go to their heads a little. According to church historian Eamon Duffy, the Renaissance papacy invokes images of a Hollywood spectacular, all decadence and drag. 
Contemporaries viewed Renaissance Rome as we now view Nixon's Washington, a city of expense account whores and political graft, where everything and everyone had a price, where nothing and nobody could be trusted. The popes themselves seemed to set the tone. For example, Leo X was said to have remarked, let us enjoy the papacy, for God has given it to us. Several of these popes, who were supposed to be celibate, of course, took mistresses, fathered children, and engaged in intrigue and even murder. Alexander VI, for instance, had four acknowledged children, including Cesare Borgia and Lucrezia Borgia. Anyway, we're not here to comment on what the popes did or did not do in their spare time, other than the fact that they were uh, also involved in the reconstruction of many of the great Roman ruins. They rebuilt St. Peter's Basilica. They commissioned the painting of the Sistine Chapel. They founded the Vatican Library, among many, many other remarkable works. Many figures of the European Renaissance have become household names. Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Machiavelli, Caravaggio, Landino, the Borgias, the Medicis, Vasari, Ariosto, Mercator, Titian, Raphael, Ortelius, Durer, Erasmus, and Christopher Columbus. It wasn't all men either. Among the leading women of the Renaissance were Margaret of Anjou, Christina of Lorraine, Queen Elizabeth I, and Isabella d'Este, the Marquess of Mantua. And then, of course, there's the enigmatic Mona Lisa. If only we knew who she was. So, where does Ireland fit into all of this? Or does it fit at all? Well, traditionally, the story is very simple. Ireland clearly had no contribution to make to the Renaissance, and the Renaissance undoubtedly had no influ influence on Ireland and the Irish. Even now, most people, including senior scholars and seasoned academics, believe, or all academics should be seasoned in one way or another, I think, um, I, uh, believe that Ireland, isolated and insulated off the northwest coast of the European continent, was simply too peripheral, too distant from the heart of the Renaissance to be implicated in any way. And here on screen are some recent comments, for example. Um, Ireland and the Renaissance perished the thought. It's preposterous. Ireland and Florence were worlds apart and words to that effect. Coffee table books on the Renaissance tend to leave Ireland out of the conversation altogether. Any superficial survey of these, including their attractive illustrations, fancy graphs, charts and timelines of the kind that end up in many academic lectures, is depressing. The Panorama of the Renaissance, published in 1996, which according to its dust jacket is a completely new and thought-provoking exploration of the era of reawakening, invention and achievement, with more than a thousand brilliant illustrations, is not well illustrated enough to include any Irish urban spaces on its map of Europe in the age of the Renaissance. Although listing Moscow and boomtown Christiania, Norway, Ireland, like Scotland and Wales, is a blank space, as you can see here. A cultural atlas of the Renaissance of 1993 features England and Scotland prominently on its chronological table, but not Ireland or Wales. As the text tells us, Ireland remained irredeemably barbarous in the period. Wales does slightly better as a cultural backwater. In Elizabeth Eisenstein's benchmark study, The Printing Revolution in Early Modern Europe, one cannot find Ireland at all on the map. It is covered by the legend. Here we go, look at this. <laughs> Yeah. Eisenstein understandably marks only those places with printing presses prior to 1500. And the first book published in Ireland, The Book of Common Prayer, did not appear until 1551. Nonetheless, one has the depressing feeling that the printing press was never destined to reach Irish shores. Of course, we know that no real academic worth her or his salt would ever resort to Wikipedia for hard facts, right? But in my desperation to find Ireland somewhere in the Renaissance, I went over to the dark side. I typed in to Professor Google, surely there I would find it. Well, no. This is the 18,000 word essay on the Renaissance in Wikipedia. And there was nothing about Ireland. But then I found this section that listed Northern Europe, England, France, Germany, where is Ireland? No, Spain, Port, Hungary, Poland, further countries. That's surely where we'll find it. Croatia, Scotland, <laughs> it's not. It's, okay, well, we'll go back to the essay and run one of those searches. Ireland, type in Ireland. In an 18,000 word essay, it's going to, nothing, nothing whatsoever. I apologize for that little visual on the side there. <clears throat> this is really Wikipedia. Uh, okay, 
So that was the Wikipedia test. Uh, fake news. Alternative facts, maybe. As an archaeologist, and we're back to, back to prehistory for a moment, I knew that Ireland's apparently peripheral location had not stopped regular and complex connections and communication with the rest of the continent. Over thousands of years, in fact. And there's evidence for contact between prehistoric Ireland and France, for instance, from as early as the Neolithic, some 6,000 years ago. And the intensity of this association ebbed and flowed over four millennia before the first historically documented uh, contacts occurred. There should be little surprise at the connections between Ireland and the continent. After all, a mere 500 kilometers separates Ireland from France at the nearest point. And Cork in the southwest of Ireland, for example, is closer to the Breton coast in France than it is to, say, London. This is all the more significant given that travel across water was so much easier through prehistory and much of the Middle Ages than it was across land. And it would have been much easier to travel across this stretch of sea to France than it would across the Irish Sea and across Wales and England uh, to London, for instance. <clears throat> but what can we say about Ireland in the 16th century? Well, Ireland at that time, I think it's fair to say, remained essentially medieval in many respects. The 1500s were characterized by the expansion of English royal power and control across large parts of the country. While secular conquest made strong headway, the Protestant Reformation did not. The Irish and the old English, who were the descendants of the Anglo-Norman settlers of the 12th and 13th centuries, remained staunchly Catholic. In the 1530s and the 1540s, the dissolution of the monasteries under King Henry VIII saw the closure of hundreds of religious houses across the country. St. Patrick's Purgatory in County Donegal, however, continued to be an important pilgrimage destination. Of course, it's a coincidence that I put King Henry VIII and Purgatory on the same slide. There just wasn't room on the next slide. It's just a, of course, it's just a coincidence. Um, English control was strongest in Dublin and the surrounding counties, the area that came to be known as the Pale. English and Scottish plantation stimulated the growth of more urban centres, but most of the country remained overwhelmingly rural. The most powerful families in Ireland were the Fitzgerald Earls of Kildare and Desmond. The Earls of Kildare were based at their ancient seat, the great Anglo-Norman castle at Maynooth, on the doorstep of Maynooth University. Histories of Ireland were written in the 16th century by remarkable scholars such as Richard Stanyhurst and Edmund Campion. Did anybody mention you could study abroad in Maynooth? Uh, <laughs> that is uh, Maynooth Castle, just there, a part of Maynooth Castle in the very bottom right of the picture. My office is over here. Uh, I see students on Wednesday afternoons, Thursday mornings, and by appointment, by email, at mutually convenient times. I'll be happy to see you next semester, the following semester, during summer schools. But just let's get back to the lecture for a moment. So now we know a little bit more about the Renaissance and a little bit more about 16th century Ireland. Where to next? Who knows, I think I hear you saying. Well, Cosimo I de Medici, Duke of Florence in the mid-16th century, was a great patron of the arts. He is perhaps best known today as the creator of the Boboli Gardens and the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. As part of the transformation of the Palazzo Vecchio into a ducal residence, Cosimo and his senior architect and painter, Giorgio Vasari, envisioned a cartographic gallery depicting through a sequence of over 50 large mural maps the entire extent of the known world. This gallery, known as the Guardaroba Nuovo, is a reflection of Cosimo's fascination with geography and cartography and a reminder of the growing importance of international commerce and shipping in the 16th century. The colorful maps are painted on, in oil and feature countries and regions of Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Americas. I don't know if Brockport features, but certainly the Americas are there. Together, they form an unprecedented and monumental masterpiece of Renaissance cartography. Working around the room in a clockwise direction from the main entrance, the very first map on the lower level of the cycle is of the Isole Britannicae, the British Isles, showing Ireland at eye level, complete with its largest islands, lakes, forests, mountains, and rivers, and over 75 named places. The Purgatorio di San Patrizio, St. Patrick's Purgatory, is clearly shown uh, in its island location in Donegal, as well as many other recognizable place names and important locations, including Trim, on the banks of the River Boyne. Did anybody mention the castle at Trim? 
Uh, this is my hometown where I'm originally from. I mean, I'm not suggesting that the Renaissance actually began in Trim rather than in Florence, but you never know. I mean, there is some culture there somewhere. And we've yet to find it, but we're, we're going to keep digging. <laughs> the Guardaroba Nuova was a room used for the safekeeping, inventorying, cleaning, and repair of portable items that were part of the Duke's property. According to Vasari, they were the most important, precious, and beautiful things that the Duke possessed. On every side were large wooden wall cupboards filled with art and curiosities from the renowned Medici collections. On the door of each cupboard was painted a different map in the series. The origin of the objects in each cupboard was reflected in the map depicted on the door. One can only imagine what might have been found in the cupboard depicting Ireland. Perhaps we will never know. Work on the Palazzo Vecchio Gallery of Maps probably began in about 1563, and Ignazio Dante, a Dominican friar and polymath, was commissioned to prepare the maps. For his map of Britain and Ireland, Dante sourced much of his information from a map that had been published in Rome in 1546 by George Lilly, an English Catholic exile who had benefited from the patronage of another Catholic Englishman at the papal court, Reginald Cardinal Pole. While England is shown shown relatively accurately, as you might have seen on Lilly's map, Ireland is not so precise. And it's likely that Dante relied instead heavily on the work of Flemish cartographer Gerardus Mercator as a source for the Irish part of the map. Gerardus Mercator was the man who was later to become known as the man who mapped the planet. And it seems that he provided the information for the map of Ireland. So on a daily basis, then, Workers, visitors, dignitaries and guests, as well as the Duke of Florence, his family and his courtiers, could have viewed this quite detailed map of Ireland, showing not just features of the natural landscape, but, quite also, but also place names and towns and castles. Here was Ireland then, on prominent display in the core of the Ducal Palace, at the heart of Florence, the cradle of the Renaissance. In 2018, many of Florence's 10 million annual tourists still clutch, catch a fleeting glimpse of Ireland at the heart of the Renaissance, even if men, most of us don't quite get the significance of that. Okay, so that's a start, but we need more evidence, don't we? Let's try a slightly different avenue. Even long before the time of the Duke Cosimo de' Medici, According to the 15th century Florentine humanist and Renaissance writer Cristoforo Landino, Gerardo, Tommaso and Maurizio, three merchant brothers of the ancient Gerardini family from Florence, were sent into exile in England at some unspecified time in the past. And while they were there, they were granted by the king of that country a large tract of central Ireland. Their descendants were the earls of Kildare and of Desmond, whose Fitzgerald surname derived from Gerardini. Landino's claim, which neatly incorporated Ireland into the far-flung Florentine Empire, appeared in his commentary on Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy, which was launched at the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence in 1481. The commentary enumerates the many grand Florentine achievements of centuries past, leaving no doubt as to the greatness of that city and its people. Of particular interest, however, is Landino's inclusion of Ireland, and the fact that so many people in the Renaissance world, world would consequently have been aware of the country and its, albeit posited, Florentine connections. A generation later, in 1516, Ludovico Ariosto published his epic Orlando Furioso. Although the association he makes between Ireland, the Earls of Kildare and Desmond, and Charlemagne is impossible on chronological grounds, Charlemagne died in 814, almost 500 years earlier, it is based on Ariosto's received wisdom that there was a link between Ireland and the continent. And of course he would have been aware of the Fitzgerald-Gerardini connections, at least through reading Landino. Indeed, Ariosto's work was later translated into English and is, no, is known to have been read in Ireland. Later in the century, in 1591, the Renaissance courtier and writer John Harrington translated Orlando Furioso into English. And during his time in Ireland with the second Earl of Essex, he read some excerpts, perhaps those relating to Ireland, we don't know, to the sons of Hugh O'Neill, the great Earl of Tyrone, to whom Harrington may have presented a copy of the translation. It's always a good idea to present a copy of your work to the people you're coming to visit, I find. Incidentally, uh, John Harrington is probably best known as the inventor of the flush toilet. 
just threw that in there. That uh, is an aside, uh, definitely. In the, 15, in the 1850s, hist uh, History of the Earls of Kildare, uh, written by Charles Fitzgerald, the Marquis of Kildare, he noted a letter among what he referred to as the Gerardini Papers, written by his ancestor, Garroyd Moore. Uh, Garroyd is the Irish for Garrett, and Moore is the Irish for Senior. So Garrett Senior Fitzgerald, the 8th Earl of Kildare, who probably wrote this um, at Kilkay Castle in South Kildare in May 1507 and addressed it to all the family of the Gerardini, noble in fame and virtue, dwelling in Florence, our beloved brethren. The letter makes, clear, makes it clear that the Earl had received correspondence from the Gerardini and that he was desirous to know the deeds of our ancestors so that if you have in your possession any history, we request that you communicate it to us. We wish to know the origin of our house and their numbers and the names of your ancestors. The Fitzgerald's Florentine connection, whatever about its dubious beginnings, was now becoming a reality. It was known and referred to throughout the 16th century in Ireland, in Italy, and in England. A sonnet dedicated to the Earl of Kildare's sister, Lady Elizabeth, by one of the first English sonneteers, Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, opens with the lines, From Tuscany came my lady's worthy race, Fair Florence was sometimes her ancient seat. Elizabeth was known as the Fair Geraldine on account of her beauty. She was a maid of honour at the court of Queen Mary, and she later married English Catholic Anthony Brown, whose daughter Mabel married the 11th Earl of Kildare in 1554. All of this sounds very incestuous, which suggests we're getting closer to the Renaissance. <laughs> the Fair Geraldine also features prominently in The Unfortunate Traveller or The Life of Jack Wilton, a picaresque novel published in 1594 by Thomas Nash, the Elizabethan pamphleteer and playwright. The narrator, Jack Wilton, describes his adventure while he was the Earl of Surrey's page in Italy. In one anecdote, he recounts how Cornelius Agrippa, the celebrated alchemist, revealed to Surrey the image of Elizabeth Fitzgerald in a magical mirror, defying all present at a tournament in Florence to show such beauty as hers. Through Wilton, Nash goes on to claim that Fitzgerald was in fact a town-born child of the city of Florence, and that Surrey went and visited the house where his Geraldine was born. Stories such as these served to crystallize the connections, perceived or otherwise, between the Fitzgeralds and the Florentines. As you can see here, the Fair Geraldine was painted by Francois Clouet, a French Renaissance miniaturist and artist, particularly known for his detailed portraits of the ruling French family. Uh, that, sorry, that's here. As you can see here, this is Lady Elizabeth Fitzgerald. Uh, she's the one on the right. Uh, painted by Francois Clouet in the middle of the 16th century. The 1526 library catalogue of Garroyd Moore's son, Garroyd Oag, Garroyd, the Irish for Garrett, Oag, in this case, the Irish for Junior, the ninth Earl of Kildare, this catalogue lists two works by St. Antoninus, the Dominican Archbishop of Florence and friend and advisor of the Medici family. St. Antonin, uh, sorry, um, two lists of the Kildare books survive, one from about 1513 and one from about 1526. The growth of the library between these two dates indicates that somebody, most likely the ninth Earl himself, was actively acquiring books to keep the collection up to date. In many respects, the shelves of the Kildare Library epitomized a Renaissance period book collection. These were the shelves of the library in Maynooth Castle. There were volumes in Latin, in French, in English, in Irish that covered philosophy, Renaissance humanism, religious, uh, and military tactics, not religious tactics, I'm sure it covered those too, and history, both classical and medieval. Among the books was a volume of Francesco Petrarch's La Volgare Opere del Patrarca con la Espazioza, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm just going to stop there, uh, published in Venice in 1525. This book bears the signature of James Fitzgerald, the son of the 15th Earl of Desmond, and inscriptions by him in English, in French, and in Italian. These lists clearly reveal the influence of the Renaissance in a major library in Ireland in the early 16th century. The presence of works by Geraldus Cambrensis, not just in the original Latin, but also both in English and in Irish translation, reflects the Fitzgerald's interests in their own pedigree. 
Geraldus Cambrensis, or Gerald of Wales, was an ancestral cousin of the Fitzgeralds and author of the first book on Irish history written by somebody who wasn't Irish. Writing in the late 12th century, Geraldus was quite scathing about the Irish and their customs, but he did praise their ability as musicians. He eulogizes the 12th century Fitzgeralds for their outstanding valor and courage. He also says, as you might see here, uh, Geraldus was a young man and remarkable for beauty and face and form. This is about himself. He's, he's writing about himself here. Uh, he was remarkable. Of, uh, he was, this was a priest with uh, ambitions to go further up the, uh, the ladder in the, in the priesthood. Um, so he's, he's, he singles out his ancestors for special praise, and particularly Morris Fitzgerald, the dynastic forebears of the Earls of Kildare. He says that Morris Fitzgerald was a modest, wise, and brave man. He was dignified, naturally good, a temperate, uh, outstanding example of polished manners, knowledgeable, courageous, careful, sober, temperate, and continent, reliable, steadfast, and loyal. He was surely a Renaissance man before his time. And of course, as many of us will know, in Ireland, being both sober and continent, a rare feat, uh, is something that you would immediately include on your resume. <laughs> the study of genealogies and family histories is a true Renaissance trait, and it's worthy to note that about the same time as the Kildare Library was being assembled, the family also employed Philip de Flatsbury, a diligent antiquarian, as an archivist and family chronicler. Flats Flatsbury wrote in Latin as well as in English, and his work was later drawn upon by Richard Staneyhurst, and Edmund, Edmund Campion for their histories of Ireland. The school books in the Kildare Library would also have served Staneyhurst, as he was later employed as tutor to the children of the 11th Earl. The books in Irish would have been of little use to Staneyhurst, however, as he proudly did not read that language. He was nonetheless a true Renaissance scholar, and by the end of his life he had achieved a reputation as an alchemist, a poet, a historian, a political activist, a humanist, and a classicist. In relation to my earlier mention of cartography, Staneyhurst corresponded with a renowned North European ge uh, geographer and map ma maker Abraham Ortelius, who himself appear, apparently visited Ireland in 1577, and Staneyhurst was the source of the information on the map of Ireland in the 1595 edition of Mercator's Atlas. During his lengthy European exile, Gerald Fitzgerald, the 11th Earl of Kildare, and his grandson, and grandson of Garoid Moore, spent time in the Duchy of Mantua, at the court of Cardinal Pole in Rome, and in Florence in the early 1540s. The 11th Earl must surely have been aware of his at least supposed ancestral links with the Florentine Gerardini. According to Staneyhurst, among the knightly service, knightly with a K, service carried uh, out by the teenaged Earl while in Florence were the duties of master of the horse and household of Cosimo de' Medici. The Irish Earl became fluent in Italian and well versed in the court culture of Renaissance Italy. If, as Irish historian and former colleague of mine, Colm Lennon suggests, Garoid Og took the opportunity to look up some of his Gerardini relatives while he was at the Medici court, then it is likely that he met Lisa Gerardini. Now, Lisa was from the quarter of Santo Spirito, um, Cosimo de' Medici, from the quarter of Santo Spirito in Florence, and was married to Francesco del Giocondo, a cloth and silk merchant, and latterly a government official with possible ties to the Medici family. Francesco was a patron of the arts, and sometime between 1503 and 1506, it appeared that he commissioned none other than a certain Leonardo da Vinci to paint a portrait of his wife. Later, Vasari would record that for Francesco, Francesco del Giocondo, Leonardo took the portrait of his wife, Mona Lisa. While nobody is certain who the model for da Vinci's painting was, many art historians believe it to have been Lisa Gerardini. Her married name also explains the other name by which this painting is well known, La Gioconda. And so it may yet turn out that the world's most famous painting and the most iconic image of Renaissance culture in fact depicts a distant cousin of Ireland's premier noble dynasty of the 16th century, the Fitzgeralds. Another possible candidate for the, as the model for the Mona Lisa is Isabella d'Este. Isabella d'Este, uh, Marquess of Mancha uh, and one of the leading women of the Italian Renaissance and to whom we will return momentarily. 
The young Earl of Kildare's sojourn in Florence and elsewhere on the continent might, might help to explain some of the contents of the 1575 inventory of Maynooth Castle, the headquarters of Fitzgerald Power. The list includes tapestries, cushions, chairs, and stools of velvet, as well as feather belts, beds, quilts, clocks, and items of pewter and silver. It's quite likely that Maynooth was furnished and decorated with a range of items brought back from a Fitzgerald grand tour of Europe in the 16th century. An earlier inventory from 1518 lists some 230 items of gold and silver plate, including several Spanish pieces, and it's likely that some of these also came back with family members returning from the continent. Maynooth Castle was described by one com commentator as one of the richest earl's houses under the crown of England. Although the castle now lies in ruins, these lists and inventories give us a good idea of how it would have looked in the 16th century. Did I mention about study abroad? Uh, there's always a possibility. There are leaflets here about studying abroad uh, in Maynooth, and uh, you can find my email address on the top of the handout. In 1530, it seems that Garoid Og had his portrait painted by German Northern Renaissance artist Hans Holbein. This painting may once have hung on the walls of the castle. It is said that after Garoid's death, his widow would kiss the portrait each night before sleeping. While little detail is known about the brave furniture recorded earlier in the century by Staningerhurst, one item survives that may have been present at that time. It is the Kildare Rent Table, a 16th century stone table with a twisted central column. It bears in relief the Kildare Arms and a Latin inscription indicating that it was commissioned in 1533 by the Earl of Kildare, probably for Maynooth Castle. Renowned furniture expert, the Knight of Glynn, noted in 2007 that the table displays capable Renaissance or ornament and that as an early example of classical detailing in Ireland, its importance should not be underestimated. The Fitzgeralds who went to Europe in the 16th century were following a path that brought clerics, students, pilgrims, merchants, refugees, exiles, mercenaries, and scholars from Ireland deep into the heart of Renaissance, albeit in fairly small numbers. The medieval links between Ireland and Italy are well documented, and in the years after the Reformation, records show increasing numbers of Irish clerics, especially Franciscans, studying in Bologna, Florence, Milan, Padua, Rome, and elsewhere. According to Staneyhurst, Thomas O'Herlihy, Bishop of Ross in the southwest of Ireland, and on your map, drawn very badly, uh, had been brought up in Italy, although it's not entirely clear what he means by this. Even before the Reformation, indeed, a handful of Irishmen had established a considerable reputation in Italy. As early as the 13th century, a man known as Peter of Ireland was a university lecturer at Naples, where he taught the renowned Dominican philosopher and theologian Thomas Aquinas, among others. In 1488, Morris O'Fihilly, who may have been from Baltimore in County Cork, was regent of the Franciscan schools at Milan, and he began his career as a university lecturer at Padua in 1491. O'Fihilly stayed in Italy until 1512, when he returned to Ireland, where he'd been, he had been made Archbishop of the Western Diocese of Tuam. He died in Galway just months after his return. Historian A.B. Scott uh, surmised, tongue-in-cheek, I suppose, that perhaps the sudden transition from the urbane, sophisticated world of Renaissance Padua and Venice to the remote fastnesses of Galway in Connacht was too much for him. Scott's more sincere appraisal of O'Fihilly as a shining example of an Irishman who integrated fully with the intellectual life of Europe at its highest and most rarefied level is a very good summary of his achievements in Renaissance Italy. O'Fihilly's Enchiridion Fidei, a book published in Venice in 1505, is prefaced by a dedicatory address by the author to Garoid Moore, patron. It is fitting that a work by one of Ireland's greatest Renaissance scholars was dedicated to a patron of learning and the church, and the book referred to simply as Enchiridion in the 1526 Kildare Library catalogue may well have been a presentation copy sent by O'Fihilly to his patron. And this would make it also the earliest known book dedicated to an Irishman. Another renowned Renaissance scholar who dedicated one of his works to a Kildare Fitzgerald was the 11th Earl's grandnephew, the Dublin-born Jesuit priest, 
William Bath. We don't know what Bath looked like, but this is an old drawing of his house in Drogheda, 50 kilometers north of Dublin on the Irish East Coast. Bath studied at Oxford in England, at Louvain in Belgium, at Saint-Omer in France, and at Padua in Italy. And he wrote one of the world's first language teaching texts. A musicologist as well as a grammarian, one of Bath's favorite instruments was the Irish harp, and he presented one that he had designed to Queen Elizabeth I. In 1584, Bath published his brief introduction to the art of music and dedicated the work to his granduncle, Gerald Fitzgerald, the 11th Earl of Kildare. The Kildare's interest in music is indicated by references in a document of 1517 to the organ maker, the trumpeter, James Trumpet, and the other trumpet. In 1535, two singers from the chapel at Maynooth sang Dulcis Amica, music composed by the Franco-Dutch composer Johannes Prioris. Further Kildare cultural patronage is evident in their employment of rhymers or poets in the 16th century. It's an indication of the breadth of their cultural interests that the Kildares possessed volumes of classical and neo-Latin poetry, while also patronizing families of hereditary Gaelic bardic poets. Like many modern heads of state, Queen Elizabeth I was presented with all sorts of gifts during her reign. In 1564, Irishman Christopher Nugent gave her a primer of the Irish language, which he had written for her while studying at Cambridge. It contains such phrases as, how do you, I am well, I thank you, uh, and their Irish and Latin equivalents. It also includes, as you'll see here in Irish, God save the Queen of England, something that you will very rarely see written in the Irish language, and <laughs> even less frequently here spoken by an Irishman. Pilgrim paths, trade routes, and communication highways between Ireland and Italy witnessed two-way traffic in the 16th century, and there are some notable examples of Italian visitors to Ireland in this period. During his term as papal nuncio to our, uh, in England, where he stayed at the court of King Henry VIII, the Italian priest and humanist scholar Francesco Chiricati traveled to Ireland to visit the famed pilgrimage destination of St. Patrick's Purgat. Oh yes, I wanted to tell you about this first. This was a presentation copy, a copy of the 1564 that was presented by then Irish President Mary McAleese to Queen Elizabeth of England on her first state visit to the Republic of Ireland in Dublin in 2011. So this was a copy of the book that had been gifted by an Irish scholar to Queen Elizabeth I in 1564, now being given by the President of Ireland to Queen Elizabeth II in 2011, 450 or so years later. And some of you might recall, this was a particularly significant uh, event, the visit of Queen Elizabeth to Ireland. And in fact, on the occasion, um, she spoke, Queen Elizabeth spoke at the evening dinner in Dublin Castle in Irish. So there were all sorts of uh, very significant, small, but enormous gestures happening at the same time, uh, bringing 16th century Irish history uh, screaming and kicking into the 21st century. So this was St. Patrick's Purgatory, um, where some of the others should have been brought kicking and screaming, uh, in uh, Loch Derg in County Donegal. Chiaricati reported on his July 15, uh, 1517 journey in a letter to Isabella d'Este. The letter describes Dublin as a port with countless ships exporting salted fish, hides, livestock, and all kinds of horses. Imports include wines and many kinds of merchandise. One can't imagine any of these exports making their way into the Irish cabinet of curiosities in the Palazzo Vecchio's Guardaroba Nuova, but the fistful of oyster pearls that so impressed Chiaricati might have made a suitable exhibit. In Dublin, Chiaricati met the, met the Archbishop and he met Garoid Og Fitzgerald, the ninth Earl of Kildare, before travelling northwards to Drogheda, Dundalk, Armagh, and on to Donegal in the, four, in the far northwest of Ireland. Chiaricati describes the ninth Earl as the premier lord. He is a man of great ability and wealth and has all the manners of an Englishman. Great praise for an Irishman to be, because he's so good, he could even be an Englishman. On the return, of his le uh, on the return leg of his journey uh, in Downpatrick in the northeast of the country, Chiaricati met one Tiberius Ugolino, a centenarian Italian bishop from Viterbo, 
and the two went fishing together for salmon. Tiberius Ugolino had been sent to Ireland in 1486 by uh, Pope Sixtus IV to become Bishop of Down and Connor in Ulster. Since 1478, the See of Armagh had also been occupied by an, an Italian, Ottaviano Spinelli de Palazzo, known as Octavian, who had been dispatched to Ireland in 1478 to get the Irish church finances into order. And so we're beginning to see here layer upon layer upon layer of contacts between Ireland and the continent in the 15th and particularly in the 16th centuries. Much of Chiaricati's letter concerns his impressions of St. Patrick's purgatory, but he does make some general observations about Ireland and its people. In general, the country is poor, except for fish, livestock, and poultry. The people are very astute and ingenious. He was clearly a very observant person. They set great store on arms because they're always making war on one another. They live on oat and bread and drink mostly milk and water. We still do. The women are very beautiful, simple, and, oft, uh, and open, but smiling. Irish people are very religious, but do not regard stealing as sinful. They live naturally, be believing that all things should be held in common. And this is where it gets a little bit like a TripAdvisor review. This accounts for the numbers of thieves. You are in peril of being robbed or killed here if you travel the country without a strong bodyguard. I have heard that in places further north, people are more uncivilized, going about nude, living in mountain caves, and eating raw meat. <laughs> now, I think if any of you here have ever been to Nor Northern Ireland, you will know immediately that this is completely true. <laughs> the recipient of Chiaricati's letter, Isabella d'Este, was a woman at the heart of the Renaissance. She was a renowned patron of the arts, a fine musician, a fashion designer, a Latinist, and a friend of great scholars and artists such as uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, and Michelangelo Marisi de Caravaggio. Members of her family were also patrons of Ariosto. Among the painters she sponsored were Tiziano, Raffaello, and Da Vinci, uh, Leonardo, who were all named after Ninja Turtles. A <laughs> prolific letter writer herself, Isabella had asked Chiaricati to write to her describing the places he visited and the people he met. Given her education and her wide reading, the Marquis of Mantua would almost definitely have read um, other descriptions of Ireland and its people, and she certainly would have read Orlando Furioso, which was just published the previous year. But Chiaricati's letter is an example of a first-hand report from Ireland coming straight, from one of the most straight to one of the most powerful and influential protagonists of the Italian Renaissance in the early 16th century. In medieval and Renaissance Italy, Ireland was probably best known for St. Patrick's purgatory. <coughs> Restoration work in the 1970s in the choir chapel of the Franciscan convent at Todi, 150 kilometers or so south of Florence, revealed a depiction of purgatory with Patrick in attendance in a fresco that had been covered with whitewash since about 1600 and was only found in 1970. It appears that the fresco was painted by a Sienese artist, uh, perhaps Jacopo di Mino del Pelliciao, uh, in the middle of the 14th century, perhaps during the worst years of the plague, when death became a central theme in all forms of art. The story of St. Patrick's purgatory had been well known across Europe since the 12th century, and Chiaricati, in 1517, joined a long list of continental pilgrims and visitors to this site. One of the primary means by which goods, knowledge, ideas, and fashions percolated between Ireland and the continent, especially Italy, was via clerics and pilgrims. Representatives from various religious orders gathered periodically at different venues for chapter meetings. Students and teachers moved between universities and seminaries. Christian pilgrims made their way to shrines. Uh, religious centers were, um, and especially Compostela in Spain, uh, Rome in Italy, and the Holy Land, stopping off in towns and villages along the way. Irish Augustinians passing through Florence would surely have paid a visit to the church of San, uh, Santo Spirito. This was one of the finest examples of Renaissance architecture to be found anywhere in Italy. Inside this church is a wooden crucifix sculpted by a young Michelangelo, 
in return for receiving corpses from the convent's hospital for his anatomical studies. The crucifix is in the sacristy, and on one of the walls of this room is a painting by Alessandro Allori of Saint Fiacre healing the sick. This large devotional painting, seen here in the center, is of the Irish saint uh, Fiacre and was commissioned in 1596 by Christina of Lorraine, wife of Ferdinand de Medici. Although Fiacre was a 7th century Irish saint, he was probably better known than the continent than he was at home in his home country. And his relics are housed at the Cathedral of Meaux, 40 kilometers to the east of Paris. In 1617, the Bishop of Meaux opened Fiacre's shrine and presented a part of his body to Cosimo II de Medici, Grand Duke of Tuscany, who was the elder son of Christina of Lorraine. A decade later, in 1627, Cosimo's eldest son, Grand Duke Ferdinand, seen here, had a chapel built in Florence in honor of St. Fiacre. Soon afterwards, in the 1630s, a life of St. Fiacre was published in the city. There seems to have been a long-standing Medici devotion to St. Fiacre, as there's a 15th century Italian-made reliquary of this saint made of rock crystal and gilt copper in the Medici chapels in the Basilica of San Lorenzo in Florence. The number of people from Ireland studying on the continent grew exponentially in the last quarter of the 16th century with the foundation of many new Irish colleges, some of which are listed on the screen here. And of course, all of us here know the importance of study abroad schemes. Um, I'm not sure if I've mentioned to you about the possibility of coming to Maynooth University on a study abroad scheme, but I think you should certainly bear it in mind. In 1577, getting back to the matter at hand, it was noted that there was a great number of students from Waterford in Louvain in Belgium at the charge of their friends and fathers. St. Anthony's College in Louvain was founded in 1607 by Flahri Omwale Cunera, a member of a prominent Bardic family, family from the west of Ireland. Another glimpse of the connections between Ireland and the Renaissance world can be seen in the remarkable collection of 15th century cloth of gold high-mast uh, high vestments in Waterford on the south coast of Ireland. Some of the materials are Florentine and the embroidery is Flemish. It's not now known how this set of vestments came to be in Waterford, but it's clear from historical and written sources that they were already there in the early 1480s. Links, both direct and indirect, were strengthening between Ireland and Northern Europe. Um, Influences of the Northern Renaissance gradually uh, seeped into Ireland via students in Flanders and Germany, as well as Oxford and Cambridge. Many English, Dutch and Walloon mining and smelting specialists were brought into Ireland in the late 16th and 17th centuries. In 1583, Sir Henry Sidney, former Lord Deputy of uh, Ireland and patron of Richard Stanyhurst, claimed to have planted about 40 families of Dutch Protestants at Swords Castle, just north of Dublin, where they repaired the old buildings and engaged in various crafts. Similar German influence is evident at nearby, nearby Lusk Church on the fine 1580s effigial tomb commemorating uh, leading Anglo-Irish statesman Christopher Barnwell and his wife Marion Charles. It has been noted by experts that and I quote, the highly ornamented armor on the male figure is typical of the middle part of the 16th century and exemplifies the influence of or the widespread market enjoyed by the Milanese and later German armorers. Among the 16th century weapons from Ireland, several swords exhibit the influence of Renaissance ideas and one from Clontarf, also just to the north of Dublin, bears the marks of a German bladesmith. While German armor and weaponry was making an appearance in Ireland, the appearance of Irish warriors was becoming more familiar within some circles in Germany and Flanders. It is possible that the man widely regarded as the greatest artist of the Northern Renaissance, German painter and engraver Albrecht Dürer, first got the inspiration and information for this 1521 drawing of Irish warriors and peasants excuse me, during the great annual Assumption procession at Antwerp in 1520 or 1521. This would have been something like a great St. Patrick's Day parade, a sort of, well, a sort of St. Patrick's Day parade in which Dürer would have seen people dressed in 
as Irish fighters and as country folk. And so then, to conclude, a friend of Francesco Chiaricati, Desiderius Erasmus, the, friend, the famous Dutch Renaissance humanist, believed that the Irish, barbarians living in a remote region beyond civilization, were untouched by the refining influences of the Renaissance. And this despite the fact that Erasmus's own works were being used to teach some Irish students, both in Ireland and overseas. Now, while Erasmus's views may have been a little harsh, it is easy to see where he was coming from. Ireland may have had musicologists and alchemists and humanists and neo-Latinists and philosophers and poets. We may be able to see the influences from the Italian and Northern Renaissances in Ireland uh, in literature, education, religion, and funerary monuments, for example. But the Renaissance is best known for its paintings and its architecture. And these are two areas where Ireland's relative poverty, its peripheral location, and its dearth of wealthy patrons militated against great achievement. Apparently isolated at the northwestern periphery of Europe, Ireland was nonetheless present, in some ways, in the very cradle of the Renaissance. It was depicted on the wall of the Medici's Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. But knowledge of Ireland was not confined to this cabinet of curiosities. Italians were intrigued by St. Patrick's purgatory, while some even prayed before an image of St. Fiacre. Contemporary writers alluded to the Florentine ancestry of one of Ireland's most fi famous and powerful families, the Fitzgeralds. If there was one family in 16th century Ireland that fitted into the ro role of Renaissance dynasty, it was them, the Fitzgeralds, the premier noble family in the land. They were patrons of the arts, the church, and learning, they promoted urban development, they founded friaries, they endowed chapels and colleges, they employed musicians and poets, they traveled overseas and brought back souvenirs and ideas. They encouraged learning based on classical sources in poetry, grammar, history, moral philosophy, and rhetoric, and stocked a library with books in Latin and vernacular languages. They may even have been related to the most famous face of the Renaissance, Mona Fitzgerald, or Mona Lisa McGuinness. <laughs> Case closed. Thank you very much.